So what drew you to engineering? Well, I actually was a, uh, a timber faller here in Roseburg, Oregon. And uh, after a while, I decided it was too dangerous and smart. Went back to school. <laughs> smart. I wish I would have done that. <laughs> Got a degree. I caught on really fast with the uh, construction portion of it. And uh, a lot of it's about just being able to see how these connections are going together and uh -huh. to understand them. All of us who make things are functioning as engineers. Engineering, as it applies to construction, means to make decisions about sizes and locations and characteristics of building materials for strength versus cost. So carpenters are engineers, but they have no credential. I don't have a credential. And it's all kind of hip shot engineering. Sometimes that's fine. The building code books are full of standard sort of call outs for spans and sizes and spacings that are pretty much construction rule of thumb. If you've been around construction any length of time, you have a feel for those things, or you should. But you're gonna get into some non-typical or some sort of life safety or some, some uh, design situations where, darn it, if you miss it, it has really expensive consequences. That's why structural engineers are such valuable partners in any sort of a project like this. I've got serious retaining conditions here. You've seen them, we've talked about them, and I knew from the first day that my hip shot Joe Carpenter engineering approach to this not only was not something I was going to be comfortable with, but it was something that the city and the county would never accept because failure of these retaining systems is failure of the whole site. As we make these decisions while we're working about size of bearing members and spacings of supports and all of these things, we are always balancing the choice of if I make it smaller and less, it saves me money. If I make it larger and more, it's stronger. And we're always making these decisions. And it is easy, and we perhaps fall into the habit of under-engineering or overkilling it. Both those are their own mistake. I tend to overkill. If I would not have hired Scott Harvey for this, I think I would have spent more money and complicated my life significantly compared to the system that he called out. Scott is from here. He's from this part of the world. He spent some time as a timber cutter before he decided, whoops, I'm going back to school to become an engineer. And he did that. And man, do I salute him for that. How many times have I wished that I may have done something like that? But beyond that, he married Retta Malone. Retta Malone and I went to Glide High School together. And what a pleasure it was the first time I went into his office. And there's Retta behind the desk, welcoming and taking care and managing the office. Um, it was just, it was an added sort of a connection that made me really comfortable engaging him for the first time. It's a real confidence builder for me to know that I don't have to just slam this and throw away zillions of dollars in overkill, which I tend to do, but rather can understand and have confidence in the fact that somebody who knows how to manipulate the numbers to arrive at the correct conclusion is giving me a recommendation that I can have confidence in, in that it is optimizing the resource that I have, which is only a certain amount of money and only a certain amount of space and only a certain amount of time, but I need to have the right outcome. He's good at it. I'm going to use him over and over. As with any other agreement you enter into on your project with a subcontractor or a provider of professional services like an engineer, you have to bring some information to them. In this case, Scott needed to know bearing conditions, geotechnical report, slopes and grades, types of soil, and what I wanted. And what I wanted was to maximize the footprint of this lot. It's not a big lot, and we want to put a nice house on here. So one of the, one of the drivers, one of the priorities that I gave him to work with was, Scott, give me a retaining condition that is strong enough to hold it no matter what and makes this lot just as big as I can make it uh, with a reasonable expenditure of uh, labor and material. An engineer goes to work when you provide them the information that they need in order to do their job. Their job is to manipulate numbers. There is a strength value, there's a tensile strength, a resisting to bending. There is a number, a specific number, that he can use in determining how much strength that piece of rebar adds to this bit of wall. There's a number about how far the rebar has to overlap to achieve the development length. 
there's a number about how far it needs to be embedded in the concrete and how hard the concrete needs to be and how wide the concrete needs to be to distribute the load over the bearing capacity. And it's all based on the numbers he has about the soils on the upslope and the amount of water and the angle of repose and, and, and. Engineers do their work with numbers. Engineering services are like every other service, and that is there are big operators and there are small operators. And you're wondering, do I need a big engineering firm or should I find a, a lone wolf, a solo flyer? What do I need? My advice is this, talk to the reputable contractors, the guy who, guys who have reputations for doing good jobs on time and on budget, and say, who do you use? They're gonna know, because their livelihood depends on all of the characteristics in an engineer that you're looking for so that you can distill all of their experience into a one or two call situation for yourself. But cost is never the primary driver with an engineer because the cost of the fee can be dwarfed by the cost of a botched calculation in either direction. If your engineer is too conservative and doesn't actually engineer but just slams your project with materials, then whatever he charges you is gonna to be too much because you're gonna pay twice in the expense of the project. And on the other hand, if he's kind of a cowboy and he perceives that he builds his value by reducing what you spend on material beyond the point where it's wise or safe, now almost none of them do that. But you don't want that either. So I would talk to contractors. I would talk to long established lumberyard owners because it's a small group where you live of people who interact in the construction business. And if you listen carefully what, to what they say, you'll be able to tell who it is that will provide real value. And that's what you need, is real value in the engineer that you hire. So there's one other, two other things you need to think about when you are interacting with an engineer. If you're going, continually going back to him or her with changes and, oh, I forgot this, and, oh, what about that, and, oh, I had this great idea, and, oh, can you change this and redraw that, you need to expect to open up your wallet and pay a little more money, maybe a lot more money, because it's certainly possible that your changes not only obligate him or her to deal with that, but it interrupts their workflow on another job or jobs where they're already behind and they're, they were in the process of making money over here and then your oversight pulled them off of that and brought them back to a project that they thought was done. That's your bad and you're gonna be paying for it. Now on the other hand, if you go to, if they have provided supporting calculations and you take it to the county for a permit and when the county does plan review they identify a mistake in the calcs or a, a code mistake that the engineer drew that they just can't authorize without sort of a paperwork fist fight to decide whether they take the engineer's word for it or the code book or their plan checkers calculation. Well the engineer needs to pay for that because that is something that in the purview of their professionalism they should have gotten right the first time. But don't make the mistake of complicating their life without being willing to heal them up because of your oversight. A checkbook is the thing that makes construction happen smoothly. I got